I'm Dr. Lauren Lownan, and I'm going to introduce you to what a microbe is, talk a little bit about why microbes are significant, focusing on infectious disease, and list the categories of microbes and give you an explanation of why this matters. A microbe can be defined as an organism that is too small to be seen with the naked eye. So let's think about a couple of ideas in relationship to this. If you're new to microbiology, you might be used to thinking about biology from the point of view of being a human. A human is an animal, and animals are examples of multicellular life forms. So plants are also examples of this. And in multicellular life forms, each single organism is composed of many, many different cells. So if you look at the average human, you have hundreds of thousands of different cells essentially piled up and organized to make one individual human. This is quite different than a microbe. In the case of a microbe, we'll have a single cell or a single viral particle, and that single ind individual unit makes up or comprises an entire individual. And that's the difference between microbial and multicellular life in a nutshell. What does it mean to be microbial or to be something that is too small to be seen by the naked eye? It means quite simply that each individual unit, each individual microbe is going to be smaller than the limit of resolution of the human eye. And that's about 100 micrometers in diameter, marked out on this logarithmic scale here. So anything that is smaller than 100 micrometers in diameter, which is about the width of a very tiny um, or a very thin, sharp pencil line written on a piece of paper. Anything smaller in diameter than that, you cannot see with the unaided or naked human eye. And that means we can't see cells from plants or from animals. And we can't see microbes like bacteria or like viruses. And we certainly can't see the particles that are inside of cells that make up animals or plants. And we can't see chemicals. In order to see anything in this tiny world, we need to magnify it. And so most of the time when we're looking at the different types of microbes that are cellular life forms, more about that in a moment. Most of the time we use microscopes that are referred to as light microscopes in order to magnify these structures large enough so that we can study them. If we wanted to look at most viruses or at different chemical structures, we might use electron microscopy, which is a much better magnification tool for things that are even tinier and other techniques to study um, atoms directly. If we want to look at larger structures, then we can just use the naked eye. There are many different ways of categorizing microbes. Here's one approach to that. You can take all of the microbes that exist in the world and you can separate them out into the groups that I have provided for you here. So you could talk about bacteria or archaea, that's how to pronounce this, or you could talk about fungi, algae or protozoa or we could talk about the viruses and so the top three lines here bacteria archaea and then all of these critters here these are all microbes that are made out of cells so each individual bacterium is a bacterial cell so this is also true for the archaea or for any of these organisms here. So these are all cellular microbes. In contrast, the viruses are microbes and they are living things, um, but they are not cellular. So they're not cellular entities, they have different looking structures. And I'll show you a picture of one of those in a moment. If you look at all of the cellular microbes that exist on the planet, some of them fall into a type of cell called prokaryote, and that's how to pronounce this word here, and others fall into a type of cell called eukaryote, which happens to be the cell type that makes up animals and plants as well. So a little bit more on that in a moment. Let me give you just a couple of examples so you can relate this content to information that you already 
know about. If you've heard all about E. coli or Escherichia coli, that's an example of a microbe that is a bacteria. Or perhaps you've heard of Staphylococcus aureus, which can cause blood poisoning and many other illnesses. That's also a bacteria. In this course, which we focus is largely on infectious disease, we won't talk much, much about the archaea, but they are tiny prokaryotic microbes that live in many different environments on Earth, first discovered in some of the more extreme environments like uh, volcanic sediments. But not a lot of these guys seem to be pathogenic, so we won't talk a lot about them in this class. When you think about fungi, you might think about the yeast that can give somebody a yeast infection, or the yeast that might be used in order to brew beer or to make wine, or you might think about mushrooms. And any of those, when you see them growing, you're looking at many, many different individuals piled up, but if you sort them down to a single individual, you'd need to magnify that with a microscope in order to be able to see it. Algae we could see growing out into a pond, in a pond if you saw something green on a pond surface and then protozoa can be a lot of different eukaryotic uh, organisms it's kind of a catch-all category the organisms that cause malaria are considered protozoal viruses an example of a virus might be SARS-CoV-2 which causes COVID-19 illness we know lots about that right now all right so microbes that are cellular are going to have cell types that are either eukaryotic or prokaryotic. The bacteria and the archaea are going to have prokaryotic cell type. The fungi, the algae, and the protozoa, all of those types of microbes are going to have eukaryotic cell types. So let's think a little bit more about what that means. This is a diagram of a prokaryotic cell. It might be any bacterium or archaeon. And so the key here is that a prokaryotic cell does not have any of the contents of the cell wrapped up in a layer of membrane. Another way of saying that is that prokaryotic cells do not have what we classically consider to be organelles. So they don't have their cell structures organized internally with the help of extra membranes. Instead, Pardon that interruption. I'm making this video at home and I live uh, just across the street from somewhere where we hear a lot of ambulances. Um, anyway, back to business. So in a prokaryotic cell, you would not have a structure called a nucleus. Instead, you would have the chromosome or chromosomes simply found within the cell, not wrapped up in an additional layer of membrane. The only membrane that we see here is the cytoplasmic membrane, which wraps up the cell. Okay, and in the content that you're going to learn in class, we're going to get into some of these cellular structures in the second week of class. So for now, I'm just going to say that these are relatively simple cells and they lack membrane-bound organelles. And that any organism that is classified as a bacterium or an archaeon, in other words, it belongs to the group's bacteria or archaea, they have what are called prokaryotic cell types, no nucleus. There's a lot going on in this figure. This is a repre representation of a very typical eukaryotic cell. And I'm not going to get into all of the details of the eukaryotic cell. I'm just going to point out that the different intracellular features or components are all bounded or wrapped up in a layer of membranes. So we've got the cytoplasmic or cellular membrane running around the whole thing, wrapping up the cell. But then within it, they've got the nucleus here, and it's got membrane wrapping it up, and then there's membrane radiating out from the nucleus. These are mitochondria, and they're wrapped up in membranes. These Golgi apparati are also wrapped up in membranes, and so on. So we have a lot of membrane dividing up the different bits of the cell. These are somewhat more complex cells as a result. And so they've uh, evolved on a different evolutionary trajectory. There are similarities between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, but also quite a few differences. And membrane-bound organelles is one of the major ones. If we take all of the living things on Earth and we place them on a map that's been drawn in such a way that it shows us the evolutionary history 
and the classification of all these living things. Then we call that a phylogenetic tree. And if you were to map all life on Earth, all cellular life that is, you would be able to organize the tree into three major clumps or domains, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryota, or eukaryo, or you, sorry, eukarya. This is a little bit old fashioned here. So all of the organisms within the domain bacteria and archaea, even though they have distinct evolutionary histories as shown by these separations in the tree, they have a common cell type and that cell type is referred to as prokaryotic. In contrast, the domain eukarya or eukaryota, all of the organisms that belong to this domain, including us in the animal uh, phyla or taxa and the plants, the, which are the only two groups of multicellular things within this domain, all of these organisms have cell types that are called eukaryotic cell types. So if you step back for a moment and you look at this tree and you think about it as a map of all living things, all of the living things on the planet are on the tips of the trees right now, and almost everything on there is microbial. So we can easily see that most of the different kinds of organisms on the planet today are microbial. In other words, microbes rule the earth. Another thing to know about this is that this tree shows evolutionary history. So anything that is at the junctions or nodes of the tree is an organism that used to exist but no longer does today. This is the path of evolutionary history. So down here we've got the very first cells that evolved on Earth. Here we've got something called the last universal common ancestor. And that pool of cells started to differentiate and to change. And some of them branched off here. Some of them branched off here. Then we have another pool of cells. Some of them branch off here. Some of them branch off here and so on. So this tree of life is probably close to 4 billion years old. And all of the organisms that were in these early roots of the tree were microbial. So in fact, for most of the history of life on Earth, life has been microbial. So you could also say that microbes have always ruled the Earth, past and present. So I showed you a little bit about a vi um, prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell structure. Just briefly as an introduction, let's also point out the fact that viral microbes also have distinct structures. So even though they aren't cells, doesn't mean that they don't have patterns within them. So this is one type of virus, one sort of viral shape. And a common thing about all viruses is that they contain genetic material, which will be either DNA or RNA. This one is DNA. And then that genetic material will be wrapped up in a protein coat. That's what all these little knobbly sort of guys are wrapping up that uh, genetic material and that will be called a capsid, that coat, and it will be made out of little interlocking units called capsomeres. Many viruses also include what are called spikes and the spikes are made out of protein sugar combinations called glycoproteins. So spike proteins are found, for example, on SARS-CoV-2 or any other coronavirus, and they're also found on influenza viruses. So they're a common viral feature. This is a cartoon of a virus. This is an actual electron micrograph of a virus infecting a host cell. Only part of the host cell is shown here. So viruses also have unique shapes and structures. This is not the only one. This is just an example of one in particular. So I have given you a definition of a microbe, talked a little bit about microbial size as part of that definition, talked about different ways of categorizing microbes, the different categories with regards to cell type if they are cellular, or just simply with regards to names like bacteria, archaea, fungi, etc. And so you might be wondering, well, why do I need to know any about of this and why does this really matter? And I would say 
There are three reasons based on infectious disease alone. The first is knowing what microbe is infecting you tells us what to take in order to treat that infection. So you don't take an antibiotic if you've got a viral infection, and you don't take an antiviral if you've got a bacterial infection. We also need to know what's infecting us and what its evolutionary history and classification is if we want to develop a vaccine to treat it or to conduct surveillance so we know the level of that infectious microbe out there. And all of these are reasons for studying microbiology and for knowing how microbes are categorized. And with that, I will conclude this video.